Hello and welcome to another episode of Boxing TV. We bring the fighters to the fans. Coming up on today's show, former British champion Richard Riakpour. Stay tuned. A massive welcome to my next guest and someone who I've admired for, for so long and he's a great guy with an amazing story and an even bigger punch uh, former British champion still undefeated uh, Mr Richard Riappel Richard how you doing mate you're well how you doing Dan thanks for having me always a pleasure mate always a pleasure now I know your you're story doing big, you're doing big things now I, you, got the you keep trying TV yeah. show <laughs> you keep I've trying seen, I've seen the journey I respect it Bless you. And I'm enjoying yours too, and I'm looking forward um, to your journey getting back on track uh, more than more than anything else. So I want to introduce you to the world. Now, the British, you've cleared up pretty much on the on the domestic scene, um, but now I can see you moving on to world level, and there's so many... Um, oh, it's a, some great fights to be had. There really, really is. But just to introduce you, a former British champion, still undefeated, uh, 11-0 now with eight knockouts, um, just a, a brilliant fighter. So one thing I love about you really is your story. The fact you literally came from nothing, the block, you know, the hood or whatever you want to call it, wherever you're from, you come from absolutely nothing and you completely turned your life around. And what we like to do with the show is inspire the young, inspire the fighters or even just the people who watch the show that anything's possible. So starting right from really the very, very beginning, kind of what got you into boxing then? So Dan, it's all started. Um, there was one day me and my friend were on our way to um, go and see another friend and we came off the platform and we started talking about different things. We started talking about boxing and he said that he boxes, which I was quite surprised. I didn't know that he used to go to the gym or anything. And we used to be around each other quite, quite regularly. And I asked him to show me some punches. He started to throw like a one, two and a jab. And I was fascinated. I just wanted to learn how to do the same thing. I wanted to learn how to throw punches. And I asked him, could you take me to the gym? And he said, yes. So after a bit of procrastination, we eventually got there to the gym. And and that's that's it. That's how it started. And I just never left the gym ever since. I, no matter what I did, I studied, went to university. I still kept on going to the gym. And I was competing in different championships around the country. And I just kept that consistent or as consistent as I possibly could, even though the studying was hard. But yeah, and, and now we're here. I haven't stopped. Awesome. One thing I don't know too much about you, you see, you mentioned that, it leads really perfectly on to my next question. So tell us a little bit about your, your amateur experience then, mate. You know, what did you achieve? Tell us a, a little bit about that. So in my amateur days, um, you know, I didn't really take it as serious as, as, serious as I should have. I used to be um, one of those fighters that would come to the gym and I would be invited to another day to, to box with an intermediate class and I wouldn't show up. And then I would have championships and I would come like three times a week. And then I realized that if I wanted to get the best out of the sport, what I need to do is come as often as possible. And once I started to do that, I started to see a change. And I, I noticed I had big power once I went in championships. I remember boxing in the novices in the ABAs and I fought six opponents and I knocked out um, five of those. Wow. And ended up losing on points in the in the six um, championships in the, in the semi final. I did pretty well. I didn't have that much fights, just around 20 fights. And yeah. then after I decided to go to university, I was always interested and had a huge love for Olympic boxing. I used to watch all the the fighters now that have doing have done great things and doing great things like Arthur Bertibiev at light heavies um, when he went up to cruiserweight went back down to to light heavyweight he boxed all of these these guys and he used to win you know by by TKOs and KOs most of the time and what I want I definitely want to discuss with you is really he didn't have it all your own way by any stretch of the imagination you know you like I mentioned right at the start you came from nothing. And I want to talk a little bit about that because I think it's good to talk about that because there may be people out there right now who are in exactly the same position who watch this and think, you know, he did it, I can. 
Do you know what I mean? That's what I love to do mm-hmm. with, with the show. So talk a little bit about that then. So tell us a little bit about your, your life kind of, you know, growing up in the, you know, the streets of London. So I grew up on a massive council estate in, in South East London. It's called Ellsbury Estate. Um, a lot of people probably aren't familiar with that unless you're like over 30s and stuff because they've literally knocked down the whole estate. There's probably a few parts of it that are about to be demolished right now. So it's like the whole history of the block. You have to like literally search it on Google. And it was the biggest council estate in Europe. And you can just imagine what I used to see on a regular basis and what was normal for me. You know, coming out seeing drug addicts um, in these 12 story flats and people, you know, you got um, crack fiends in, in the staircase, on the stairwell, just taking, taking drugs, um, rob, robbings, um, robberies, sorry, robberies, um, all different types of things, police cars, sirens, like that was just normal. You just heard them every minute, helicopters, you know, police, police choppers chasing different people or air ambulances, people getting stabbed shot all different types of things used to happen and it was absolutely normal to me i didn't think anything of it it was only until i started to mix and mingle with people from all different types of backgrounds when i used to compete um as an amateur boxer flying up um down back and forth down the country and that's when i noticed that people actually lived completely different lives and when i used to talk about the things that i used to um, find normal they used to listen to me with like with undivided attention and it was like a movie. They used to always describe it as it sounds like a movie. Yeah. Like what you're telling me now. And but that's that was literally my life. Um I was I had great parents. My my dad was was a role model that I should have been looking at and looking up to. And my mother. She was a hard working woman and she still is trader. And my dad is a teacher. But we were more interested in this type of culture, this gang culture, this who who had the most girls, who had the 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 cool clothes and trainers, um, the the finer the finer things, you know, and materialism in general, and that's what we was interested in. So anybody that had that type of that type of swag about them, and they had you know the attention from the women, that's what me as a young boy, that's what I looked up to. I see. And I mean, I can imagine now how, how kind that. of uh, popular I would be. I mean, I'm absolutely hit with the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're more likely to hit me. I um, imagine then. You know, yeah. Oh, I'd, I'd be leading the block, mate. I would be leading the block. <laughs> so I read, I read up on you, and I read through some of your, your kind of things that you said in, in the past, and um, I saw a, a story that you spoke about when you kind of had to run from gunshots. Um, talk us through what happened there, because I'd, I'd love to. You know, be educated exactly what's going on there. Yeah, Dan, like, it was crazy growing up um, on the estates. Um, I couldn't even recall exactly what happened, the ins and outs, but this, these are the things that used to happen on a regular basis. I remember there was different is- issues. There was people getting shot and stabbed around in and around the corner. I remember when um, somebody got shot, like, on the on the main road where I used to live and we were just around just around the corner if not off the street and we saw like a big crowd running towards us and that's when we just literally just turned around and started running backwards towards the estate and then that's when we found out finally that yeah somebody got shot so these this this was normal it's almost like a different world a different system this is how it works here everything else doesn't matter yeah yeah. Must and be a strange you're... thing. Must be so strange to to have that. Very and it's, strange. it's all you've got. Do you know what I mean? So you have to try and survive. In a, Very I mean, strange. do you feel that kind of that boxing, straight to the point, boxing saved your life then? Absolutely. Because I, I'll tell you this then. You have to bear in mind, a lot of these these youth on the streets now, they get themselves involved with all different types of trouble, just because of boredom. They have nothing else to do. They have nothing to channel their energy to imagine a young team bursting with energy and and doesn't have a purpose or a goal set they are gonna fall to anybody that shows them a bit of love especially coming from a broken home 
and they don't get that attention, anybody that shows them love and, and gives them a sense of belonging, they're going to gravitate to that. And whatever um, they tend to do or they're involved, or, or involved in or into, they're just going to become a part of that. It's just that simple. And then that's when you get the different hierarchies and people that want to be... Um, want to build their name, build a recognition, and that's when they start doing more crazy things. It's, it's a crazy, crazy word, um, world, basically. Now, you spent quite a lot of time with Dillian White, didn't you? Um, did quite yeah. a lot of sparring with him. What kind of things did you learn um, from Dillian during these uh, these sessions? So from Dillian, um, it's, I learned a few things. I learned, I learned about grit, grit and and imposing your willpower to get what you want in the ring, that result. Um, you know, they had, you know, Dillian always kind of had one philosophy and this one notion, like you break your right hand and you box with your left hand. <laughs> like, uh -huh. that's how it goes. And that, all of that rubbed off on me. I, just, I started to learn more about the business. When he headlined shows, I'll be in and around studying and observing everything around what, what it takes the media work, um, preparing yourself mentally, keeping focus whilst there's so many things going on at the same time. Um, what the fans like to see, you know, what what it takes to 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 sell pay per view fights, and all of these and, and get a decent result. So I've learned a lot from being around, and also like the camps, you know, what what his camp was like. What he, how he used to do things. We had the same coach at the same time. So it was, it was quite interesting. I learned so much. Cool, cool. And, you know, as of late, we've heard Tyson Fury has had a good look of who hit list, if you like, a hit list of <laughs> yeah. four or five <laughs> different fighters. Yeah. Uh, Dylan White being one of them. Uh, I mean, how, how would you see that fight going, mate? Yeah, that would be an interesting fight. I remember... Then, you know, I've heard Dillian tell me that he, you know, he put down Tyson Fury in, in sparring. You know, I don't know how true that is, you know, but people don't really lie about things like that. Well, yeah. some do actually, yeah, <laughs> tell a lie. But you know, Dillian, he he won't be a, the one to kind of just say that for no reason. So maybe maybe it's like um, it's it's he just wants to get revenge, maybe you know, from that from that sparring session or him talking. In the past, I think it would be a good fight. Obviously, Dillian, he goes for the body a lot with heavy shots, which will make it very interesting. And he would come, he would definitely come forward, and he's not scared to take a punch. It's a big body, too. Whereas, yeah, yeah, it's big body. And Tyson Fury, you know, he's, he's the infamous boxer, naturally gifted with agility, um, move, uh, everything. So. And with that boxing IQ, so he's going to be, be that would be a really interesting fight. I think that was yeah. quick. Great mix of styles. I mean, he couldn't be yeah, couldn't be any absolutely. further apart, could they? It it would gel perfectly. Yeah, look forward to that one. So you've now had a bit of t a bit of time off, haven't you, over the last eighteen months or so? Um, still undefeated, which is is fantastic, and you've pretty much wiped out anybody on on the domestic scene, but. You've now signed with Boxer and Sky Sports. Um, is there any reason that you've signed with the Boxer and Sky Sports side of things rather than the DAZN Eddie Hearn side of things? Yeah, it was, you know, I got, I got, I received deals from everybody. I, just, I received deals from BT, from, um, you know, interest from BT, um, DAZN, and obviously Sky Sports. But it was a, it was a, it was a difficult choice, to be honest. You know, I have, I'm close to Frank Smith, Eddie Hearn. They like me. I like them a lot. They gave me a big opportunity initially. And I always wanted to be a part of of, of their their projects. I wanted to be a, a part of what they're doing because I, 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 I really rate it. You know, I, I rate the work ethic. Uh, a lot of people say, you know, Eddie has come from this background, it was easier for him, but I see the hard work, you know, you can't, you can't miss it. It's, it's there for anybody to see. They put in work and I, I respect that. Yeah. Um, at the same time, I, I also boxed on a platform which I dreamed about boxing on from 
when I was boxing on the small hall shows at Yoko. So it was it was a it, it was a difficult choice, you know. Do I go with Eddie and a match him on the zone, or go with Sky Sports? And I realized that you know I built most of my my whole um, most of my fights have been on on Sky Sports. Uh-huh. And plus the deal that they offered financially made a lot of sense. Um, they they made me some promises which they've been, you know, which they've kept to. They've stuck to their word. They said they would look after me, and okay. you know that's that's what I want. I'm I'm at that stage in my career where, you know, I want to push on. I want to have that these opportunities presented to me, and I just needed that assurance. Good. Well, I hope they fulfill the promises that they've that they've said. That's the the main thing. And I want to talk more about your career and your your glory night of when you beat Jack Massey uh, for the yeah. the British title. I mean, how mate, how did it feel to kind of to become British champion? I mean, that that's some people's absolute world title. What a belt! How did it feel? It mate? Was, it was, honestly, Dan, it was actually it didn't really dawn on me until maybe a year later. A lot of people used to say. The best belt in the world is the British title. Yeah. And when people used to say that to me, I never used to understand, like, what, what are you talking about? Have you heard of, of a world champion? Have you heard of a world title? And it's only until I start to analyse the, you know, the whole circuit and, you know, everybody always talks about um, these organisations and how many belts they bring out, which kind of dilutes the the image of a champion because everybody's got a belt. Everybody looks like a champion. The casual fans don't understand the difference between one belt to another. You're a champion and he's a champion. There's 10 champions in the same yeah, way. Globals and, and internationals very, and global, silvers. Like, honestly, and... It's, it's, it's very confusing. But guess what? With the British title, only one person can be champion. There's no interim British tri- title. There's no none of that. It's just, are you mandatory? Yes, you're mandatory. And you're gonna fight for the British title yeah. soon. And, and I think that's, that's what makes you so and special, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? There's not. That's a, what makes no, it special. Yeah, that completely exactly, no interim. Dan. Yeah. Now I understand when you got when you've got the British title and you're a British champion, or you've won one um, in the in the past. That's that's in the history books. Yeah. And and that's it. And it's not gonna be forgotten because this country. They hail champions, British champions. Yeah. It's it's a big, very, very big deal. It's a big and deal. Even in yeah. the cruiserweight division, there's not been many cruiserweight British champions. If you go and check back in the history, there's there's not been many. You know, David Hay, um, um, Johnny Nelson, you know, me, uh, Lawrence Coley. There's not been too many. <laughs> and this leads perfectly, really. You mentioned a Coley there, um, and it's a question yeah. I wanted to ask you. Is this a fight? I mean, I, I don't know how close you are with him. Uh, but I mean, is this a yeah. fight you'd you'd like? Is this a fight you'd take once you warm back into your career again? Absolutely. You know, this it's a fight that everybody wants to see. Everybody messages me. They they that's the fight that people want to see. They see me as a a, a big guy, big strong power puncher. And when they put me against other fighters like Chris Bennett Smith or you know Tom McCarthy, everybody else in the top ten, they will always lean to me even if they don't like me as a fighter or like my style they'll say i think richard will probably take it i lean more to richard but with a that's a fight you just don't know what can happen you say a has got more experience a fought more times he seems a little bit more polished you know and richard's a bit more raw but if richard does land one of his power punches then that could be the end good night i've never seen a take a, a powerful punch which and that's how it starts it just all starts with that type of uh, you know th- those questions when you ask yourself and that's what makes it an interesting fight you just don't know where it's going to go but just imagine in in 15 fights what I can learn with my power with my will you know to win trust me it's just I think I can literally achieve the unthinkable is heavyweight on the cards in the future maybe I mean you're an absolute giant yeah, I do want to mix that heavyweight. You know, I, I sparred a lot of heavyweights. I sparred AJ, sparred Dillian White. You know, I was supposed to go and spar Fury, but I smashed my hand up in one of my fights. So I had to postpone that. And yeah, You'd be a perfect wilder sparring partner, you would. 
Yeah, yeah. A lot of people. <laughs> in fact, I remember when I saw David Hay in Las Vegas and he was telling me that I should definitely go on Spa Wilder. He said it would be good for me. Um, I think I, my balance is, you know, you know, not to um, write off Wilder, but my balance is is on another level compared to Wilder. You know, my my speed, etc. You know, I think I can definitely mix it, and plus I can punch, which you know is a blessing. You know, a lot of people you can really punch. You know, when it comes to talk, of, yeah, it's like when when we talk about power. You know, it's it's like a blessing from Mother Nature. It's like you got it or not, and I just happen to have been blessed with it, and that has got me out of trouble in some occasions, which, you know, I'm fortunate. So I could definitely mix it and I plan to do that you know, with a six foot five height and wide, wide frame. I can definitely pack on weight a big boy. around hundred kg. So yeah, for sure. You're a massive guy, huge, huge guy. I wouldn't like to get it by you anyway. Yeah. God, who's away? <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Brilliant. So one thing we like to do, and again, I mean, what a great story you've got coming from absolutely nothing. You know, boxing saved your life. You've gone to university. You've had just, you had your son, and you know, you completely turned your life around, which is just incredible. Um, but what we like to do is try and inspire the, you know, the guys coming through. Um, what advice would you have for, you know, for people and fighters coming through the ranks? So my advice um, for the fighters coming through the ranks, I think it's all about self belief. You know, if you believe you can achieve, it's just that simple. Some people won't back you. You would have close people around you. When you talk about um, taking a fight with a certain individual who's a threat, they'll be like, no, don't take that. Honestly, sometimes you just have to take risk, take roll the dice, and you have that full belief in yourself, that self-belief, which would help you to win, to win these titles, win, win these, win against these odds. And trust me, it can happen. I wouldn't, I've, I've been in the same position before, you know, even to the point where I nearly doubted myself on some occasions, but then I just, I just thought, you know what? I got nothing to lose. It's like, what's the worst that can happen? You know, you just go for it. And, you know, you'll be surprised how things will turn out. I feel like I didn't really have the correct role models, you know, growing up. But if I did, things could have been very different for me, even though I had my my mom and my dad, which I, you know, I grew to understand that they were my perfect role models, but, and they have turned me into the fighter that I am today, honestly. Fantastic. You know, that this will to win and, and to never, ever give up. But being that young and looking from left to right and looking for other figures to look up to, everything was all wrong for me. And I want to be one of those people where you could actually resonate with and say, look, Richard came from that, that lifestyle. If he can do what he did, then honestly, why can't I do that? Yeah. Like it doesn't have to be boxing. It can be absolutely anything. It can be, um, um, you know, it can be, it can be absolutely anything, you know, it yeah. doesn't matter what field it is, but just, you need to push for it, push for it and focus on your purpose, focus, focus on what you want to do and just, just put your energy into it. That's what it is. Put energy in, and nothing's going to come without hard work. You know, you have to commit yourself to a certain goal, a certain, certain ambition, and then just go for it. Honestly, there's nothing you have nothing to lose. So, if I can, you know, be that person that you can look to, then that's perfect. If I can speak to, you, you know, I go into schools all over the the UK and I talk to people. If I can get through to one individual, then that's been a su successful talk. Yeah. And that's what all it's about, helping each other and spreading a very positive message. Absolutely. I mean, who knows? You can save a life just like boxing saved yours. So amazing words, really, from an amazing guy. Uh, I just want to say a massive thank you, mate, for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you too, Dan. Appreciate that.
My name's Isra Asif, also known as Izzy, former professional cruiserweight boxer, now the founder of GBM. We at Global Boxing Management are working with promoters locally, nationally and internationally to make sure our fighters are put on the best possible shows. GBM, guiding fighters to the top.